I really wanted to simulate this visceral like performance listening experience and have it just kind of feel like you're sitting there in the audience, but almost like more intimate than just sitting in an audience, like really focused, but wide. It is great to see today's guest and what he's already done at the beginning of his career. Can't wait to see where he goes from here. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Christopher Jeffer, who is a double bassist and recording engineer and recently released a solo bass album titled Cat's Cradle. So we dig into the inspiration for this album, what he's learned about recording double bass, which is something I get a lot of questions about, the challenge of (laughs) doing this recording during a pandemic, goal for the future and a lot more you can check out the album on spotify apple music Bandcamp. that's all linked up to in the show notes and quick shout out to our sponsors dorico ear trumpet labs and modacity but let's dig into this conversation with christopher jeffer how big is the school we're tiny now actually all of our bases just graduated pretty much okay okay so (laughs) a little bit of a situation but we're we're trucking on anyway <laughs> do they do they have bachelors and masters at bowling green or uh is it just un- undergrad only or how does that work there totally we we have a bachelor's program we have a master's program we also have a doctorate of contemporary music which is kind of like one of the biggest draws to the university so oh, wow, we've got all sorts of folks it's just oh, cool <laughs> yeah okay no, totally that's interesting well wow. how far how far away from toledo is it a pretty 20 close? Twenty minutes, forty oh, okay. minutes. So it's real close. Okay, I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Where is Toledo in relation to like? Uh, it's kind of it's it's kind of not too far from Cincinnati, but not too far. It's kind of in the middle there, right? Isn't it? Is it? Is it? How far is it from Cleveland? Uh, is it kind of equidistant or? So we're we're actually like right in the northwest corner. We're actually closest to Ann Arbor, about an hour oh. down. But out Cleveland's two hours, down to Cincinnati's three. It's really okay. <laughs> a little bit far from everywhere. Okay, okay. I, I knew. Uh, oh, I guess. Okay, got it. I know a bass player that used to play. I should know better than that. I used to live in that part of the country, but, um, <laughs> but I know a bass player used to play in the Toledo <laughs> Symphony and is out here in California now. So um, okay, that's. Oh, so you're close to Ann Arbor. Okay, got it. Okay. Cool. Sure. What's what's yeah. next for you? What do you have? Do you have plans post post senior year? Um, I was gonna go to grad school, and then kind of COVID, and also just like weird, like I want to do things, and I think the the project that we're gonna talk about today really pushed me over the edge with that because I fell in love with, um, I guess, creation, um, creation of like music, and then also like the recording aspect of that. So I think I'm gonna either end up in Philadelphia or Atlanta and just work freelance as a musician and audio engineer. At least that's the plan right now oh, for cool. a little bit. Do, do you have some Philadelphia or Atlanta roots? Uh, are you, are you, where, where are you from? Are you from either of those or? I'm actually a Hungarian immigrant, um, but oh. I grew up in Jersey, uh, North okay. New Jersey. <laughs> okay. When, when, okay. Wow. That's cool. Okay. Well, why Philadelphia or Atlanta? I mean, those are both great towns, but I'm, I'm just curious. For sure. I like, I mean, I spent four years in Bowling Green, which is kind of like a cornfield. And I spent 19 years in Jersey, which was right outside <laughs> New York City. And I just needed like something that was a little hip and a little new. Um, and I've got buddies in both. It was just kind of like, let's make something happen. Let's do something cool. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I've, I, it's, it's weird. I've never somehow, I don't know how I haven't ever been to Philadelphia or Atlanta, but those are two of like the big cities that I've just never, <laughs> I don't know. My travels haven't taken me there. It's kind of, it's strange. I, I know I'll get to both uh, one of these days, but hopefully soon, but that's cool. Well, go, good luck uh, w- regardless of where you go. I know that Atlanta has a great just music scene in general, all, all sorts of different kinds of styles and genres. And then Philly's just a, a big town in general and kind of tied into everything. So, sure. wow. Wow. Cool. I don't know if we started or not. I never, I don't, these are totally informal, but I go through an edit. So it's, the, oh, really? it's, it's, just, it's not, it's <laughs> not live in any way, shape or form. So, um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for oh, reaching cool. out. I really, I really <laughs> appreciate it. It's uh, yeah. How, um, what's it been? And we can talk about anything you want. Obviously we, we let's talk about the album and the composers and the recording and all that, but like uh, what a crazy couple years to round out your undergrad probably pandemic <laughs> how has that been how has that been for yeah. for you <laughs> like about a year ago like right around march 
we went all online and I was like, God, am I going to do like my last year with my grad auditions and my senior recital on this album, which had been like in the concept phase for almost like two years um, prior to, I guess, now. And I, and I it kind of settled into like, you know, I've been here long enough. I really need to grow and do something new. So it was just like powering through no matter what it meant. And it, it was this constant pull of like, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot going on. There are not a whole lot of opportunities, but how am I going to like make those opportunities work for me? Because I didn't want to just kind of coast through my senior year. There was so much like I had built up and worked for for it that it just didn't make sense to me to do it any other way than like the best possible way, you know? Well, so tell me about this project or tell people listening <laughs> about, about what you've been up to. Yeah. Yeah. Bowling Green is really kind of neat in the way that, so the honors college has this capstone requirement and essentially it's, they allot you two advisors and you get independent study time with both of them. And I thought like, God, that's a really cool opportunity because there's so many folks teaching here that are really bright and really just experts of their field. And I mean, Bowling Green as a whole is like very reputable for our new music scene. So I was kind of raised up in that culture um, doing my undergrad and my recording professor, Mike, I remember taking my like advanced audio class and being like, Hey man, I kind of want to put together an album of new music. Like, are you into that? And he was like, yes, let's do that. That sounds so cool. And from then it was just like, what are the steps? And it was always just like a matter of going from the first place and the concept phase, which is like, well, I'm not a composer. I'm a bass player and I know how to set up microphones, but I (laughs) have never written anything in my entire life. So how is that going to happen? And I was just so grateful to have all these composers from Bowling Green um, come out of the woodwork to kind of just write for this project. And that was the first phase was like the commissioning phase, which was nuts. I remember just like firing off emails. And I know at one point we were working with six or seven composers and then just based on like differences in like aesthetic and what we were going for and people's time constraints, it ended up diluting down to just the three that are on the record now. And God, the the people that I worked with were just like so cool. And from the get go, I was just totally all about, you know, I I reached out to you because I love the music you're putting out. I want to be like a part of this. How can we like most like effectively convey your vision and my vision in a way that is like convincing and idiomatic and like just really cool to listen to. And I know that, um, the first piece actually that was written for this project was written back in March of last year, right before the pandemic hit. That was actually the last live performance that I did um, before everything shut down. And it was this really cool um, opportunity at Bowling Green called 24 by 24, where a bunch of composers are selected and paired with a one-to-one with a performer. And the composers write a piece in 24 hours and then the performers learn it in 24 hours, and then we have a whole concert on it. And that was um, the second track on the album by Stephen Naylor, uh, Threads Wisps, which is just like a super hip, um, kind of referential to early 1900s French Impressionism. And it was just like, man, I've been like bouncing around with this idea to like record this thing. And him and I had talked about like, doing something for that, like a commission and for that. And it was just serendipity that we got paired together. And it was like, okay, well, this is the first one. This is ha- has to be the first one. Um, and from there, it just evolved. I know that now the the first track on the album, Leah Tracy's uh, Forest Land came about because I was talking about Steven's uh, music and she was living with me at the time. She's still living with me. And she was like, let me write for this, please. And I was like, okay, absolutely. I was gonna ask you anyway. Um, And like with all the music just kind of slowly coming my way, it was like, well, how do we then make this something? And it was always like, I think with with art like this, there's a matter of, do you you lean into this really hard and make it like this this statement and make it like very professional? Because there was always an opportunity to kind of like lean back and just make it a, a school requirement that 
didn't really matter to anyone. And I think the moment that you access that vulnerability, something really special came out of this project. And that was like the the beginning of this year and a half long process for me. <laughs> That's awesome. So what this started as kind of a school requirement, like a thesis, like, like, is there a requirement to do something kind of out of the box like this? For, for your program or? Yeah, so for, for my program specifically, um, there's kind of like this honors thesis and I know a lot of folks do like a research requirement. There's a component of like Cat's Cradle that is like research based. I really wanted to nail down like a linear methodology for recording the double bass and recording in this setting because I know that when I got started, there's just so many steps to putting together a record like this that unless like that's your education, it's really tough. And I remember watching a lot of folks posting on like the Contrabass Conversations Facebook page about like, how do I mic bass? And I was like, let me, let me figure this out. What is the best way to mic bass? Really affordable, really like user accessible. And then once you have those recordings, like what do you do with them to make it something that is like worth listening to at the at the end stage of that process this episode is brought to you by dorico the advanced music notation software by steinberg and here is senior product manager daniel spreadbury on the challenges of designing music notation software i think one of the things about music notation software is that it does so many jobs to do because it's serving such a wide range of, of users you know whether you're a high school teacher or you're a student or you're a composer doing concert music or you're doing the jazz chart or you're doing movie music or you're doing an audio mock-up for a job or a music minus one rehearsal track for your ensemble or whatever it is the jobs to be done they cross you know this enormous horizon I am a huge fan of Dorico. I use it every single day. There's a free version you can check out that lets you do practically everything uh, to two parts. So if you're doing exercises or bass duets or anything like that, that will meet your needs. And you can check out the other options as well. Dorico.com will take you there. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. These are hand-built microphones out of Portland, Oregon, and they make an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. Barry Green got to try out this mic at our 2020 Online Bass Summit where Ear Trumpet Labs was a sponsor, and he was singing its praises all weekend long. It's an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear, natural sound and great feedback rejection. It's durable and works with in-ears, monitors, you name it. Not to mention, Christian McBride, Barry Bales, and Missy Raines are all Nadine users. Whether it's classical, jazz, Americana, or bluegrass, this mic seriously delivers, and they're offering a free t-shirt, especially to Contrabass Conversations listeners with a purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and check out Nadine. How do you mic bass? Because I have no idea. It's it's funny. I, I, rec <laughs> I record stuff, but I'm I'm such a I'm a total novice. You know, I have this um, Zoom H6 I'm talking into right right now, but I have just the XY capsule, and then Nadine, the Ear Trumpet Labs, the mic they became a sponsor. So I've been using that, which is like not you know I I I'm not really the target audience for that mic, but I have it, so I like it. But I still don't know what I'm doing. I just like randomly go into Ableton if I'm recording something audio, and I just start tweaking until it sounds good. But I, I have no idea what I'm doing so like it's a big question but like how how do you record a bass there are a lot of different opinions and I think you can do a lot of different things with a lot of different setups and then the whole post-production phase of it you can really go crazy and I think there are a lot of sounds that work in that that space I know for me I really wanted to simulate this visceral like performance listening experience and have it just kind of feel like you're sitting there in the audience but almost like more intimate than just sitting in an audience, like really focused, but wide. And I know that my, um, a lot of times this sort of thing is like going against what you don't like in recordings. And I know there, there are a lot of recordings I listen to where the bass was just getting spot mic'd and just like in terms of the physics and the, the physicality of the instrument, I mean, these like frequencies are so low and when you get like really low frequencies these wavelengths are so long unless you space these mics way back how are you gonna get like the entire harmonic content and the entire sound that this giant thing is producing and it's like balancing that against like well the farther back you put the mics the less focus you're gonna get so i remember like the first two or three recording sessions i was just like out there with my tape measure, measuring out distances and adjusting and listening back and thinking like, ah, oh, that's not right. And shifting stuff around. Um, 
And actually, the entire album is recorded with just two microphones. Wow. So, <laughs> okay, cool. Perfect. And, yeah. and where, where, where were you recording it? Were you getting into a space on campus there? Or uh, what, what was the recording space that you were using? Yeah, actually, this was the first major hangout that came with uh, recording a solo album in COVID. Because yeah, I was supposed to use the uh, universities. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there were there were a couple of times where I was like, guys, this like project is not going to happen if we can't if we can't make it happen. And originally, I was supposed to get into the like the multi million dollar recording studio on campus. That's just so nice, and it's where I studied audio recording, and I was so excited to use it. But it was just shut down because of COVID. So the first two tracks ended up being recorded in First Presbyterian Church here in Bowling Green. Um, and that space is just gorgeous. And I'm so grateful to Aaron and the guys at that church who let me get into that space because that was so cool. Um, but it was like kind of like a fly by the edge of my seat type deal because I don't know if they'll have time this week to let me in. And a lot of it happened to work out so that each track had to be recorded in one day. Mm. Um, all the stuff needed to get done. I think total there were three recording sessions of actual like tracking for the album. And actually, once we finished the second track on the album, I still had this one to do with the electronics. And they're like, sorry, we have no more time for you. And we're closing the building because COVID like cases are going up. And I was like, oh, well, how am I going to do that? And so my recording professor ended up getting me into the big concert hall here at Bowling Green State University, uh, Kobacher. And that was surreal. I mean, like I've never played on that stage outside of an orchestral setting and it was, it was really cool stuff. I mean, and that introduces all sorts of different elements of like, how do I blend these two spaces together to make it a cohesive um, soundscape across the tracks? And that was <laughs> a whole, whole ordeal. Yeah, but that's gotta be tough because a church acoustic, you know, they vary, but they tend to be much ringing, ringier or whatever the term is. Um, well, it's so cool. So all of them were recorded in a nice space. You weren't having to do something in like a dry carpeted room so you could take advantage, but but yeah. How, so how, yeah, yeah well, like you know, we're, we're both sitting here in, in our, carpeted rooms right now talking at the skull and, and i've my my just sort of goofing around during the pandemic you know i'm just recording here so it's like the driest bass sound imaginable and then i'm playing around but like <laughs> how, what did you what did you do to to try to balance out those two spaces i'm sure the product before you started doing stuff in post must have been pretty different right no definitely and i think i i mean big credit to my my recording professor mike lorello who ended up doing the master on this record because there was a lot of stuff that i i did my very best to work with and he was just like i've, I've got you but i mean the biggest thing that that drove me nuts was the hvac system in the church <laughs> it was so loud and trying to balance that with the kobacher hall that was just silent and just pristine and it was like god how am i gonna balance all this out and i think like once you like strip down like this is the sound and this is the core sound and then play with timbre and reverb and all that sort of thing you can really um make it more cohesive and that's what i found at least with with my experience a lot of it is just like trial and error as you said you go into like ableton or I've, i was using pro tools and you just fiddle with settings until you're like that sounds right i guess <laughs> <laughs> what what mics were you using you said you ended up just using two mics uh what uh what what were your mics of choice and actually i ended up getting a pair of the earthworks tc25s which are so cool and i mean the the range of human hearing is 20 20,000 hertz mm -hmm. um and those record right up to 25,000 so you get so much um so much harmonic color out of those things it's really it was really kind of surreal to like be able to record on microphones like that and i ended up getting those because i had some recording gig that was a little bit more highbrow and had a budget i was like i can justify buying these right now which is how it usually turns out but originally, I was going to record them on the Rode M5s, which are like $200 mics for the set. And they sounded 
pretty good pretty good and i highly recommend it if you're looking to record bass on a budget like <laughs> okay cool yeah i love road mic. i'm talking to you on a road mic here i wouldn't use this for recording bass but i get the the road pod mic i think this one is so um i just bought it because it looked cool but <laughs> but i like, totally. I like it anyway <laughs> uh, so wh where did you end up placing the mics uh and maybe it was different in the two spaces but what 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 did you sort of settle on um so i think in the biggest factor was distance from the instrument. Um, I ended up getting about like eight to 10 feet away. Um, and I did it in a raised space pair. I'm gesturing with my hands. I don't know if anyone's gonna <laughs> see, see what's going on with my hands, but um, I, I did it in a raised space pair with the two mics about two feet apart from each other. And I felt like that captured um, both enough of the, like the resonance and the room noise while also because the mics were tight enough around the um, edges of my instrument, I was able to get a really focused sound on the inside of like the stereo image. And then that coupled with um, just like directing them right above maybe where the heel is on my instrument in terms of height, I think they were raised 53.5 inches. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt like that got me a really nice balance of like, bow noise and finger noise and also just like the big resonant because I wanted like that visceral um like ear candy of like you could hear my fingers on the the fingerboard while I was playing I wanted it to really feel like whoever was listening was in that space with me for the whole of it yeah, that's the sort of stuff I love. I love hearing those those sort of noises. That's the sort of thing. Again, I'll keep bringing up Ableton because that's my software of choice. But I love going into their whatever the the in software instrument is that uh, uh, replicates like plucked instruments. You can change like the plectrum on the instrument and where you're playing on the string. And it's like I can if I want to lose four hours in a hurry, just like set me down in front of that with some headphones and like playing around with reverb and that sort of thing. Um, I so I am such a, a novice with audio stuff, but there's all this sort of like sort of folk wisdom about about uh audio and the bass and since i got you on the line let me just let me just throw some of the things i've heard a lot and you can like uh tell me how based in reality they are or not so so the 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 thing i've heard a lot as a string player is that all that high frequency noise that like comes off of the strings or like like you know when you're the actual player experience and again i would love you for you to like fill in the gaps with or like to tell me i'm totally wrong but like like the what what i I've always heard is that all that high frequency noise kind of like goes more up and kind of like almost like in your face and the sound if you're if you're like thinking about the stage and going out across the stage more of the bass frequencies are going that way i have no idea if that's accurate or not and i'd love that whole long wavelength thing about the sound of the bass i think is really interesting I, that's come up a couple times over the last few years just chatting with people uh, but like how does sound how do I mean, well? Let's keep, here's a huge question. How does sound work, or maybe more specifically, like how does sound work on the bass? Uh, am I at all right in any way with that folk folk knowledge? Totally, and I and I think there's a, a certain degree of all of that involved in it. I mean, with the with the bass, the the biggest issue is directionality, and that happens with any large instrument when you're micing like tuba. Where where is that sound going? Where do you put a mic to capture all that? And I think it really depends on the instrument it depends on the space because not only are you capturing the, the sound that's coming off the instrument but you're catching this um these short wavelengths and these long wavelengths that are reflecting and diffusing all across the room that you're in and depending what kind of room you're in which like for a church is really acoustically nice you know there are a lot of like weird angles for sound to kind of get caught in and reflect and come back to these microphones which are omnidirectional, at least the pair that I use, they're collecting sound from all around them and trying to balance how you're going to get those high frequencies if they are on your instrument or in your situation, just shooting right up is a, a thing to consider. And a lot of it ends up being um, like, you know, you just have to record yourself and listen back. And I would love to come on here and be like, this is my my firm methodology for recording the the classical double bass. You all should set up your bikes like this, but it's it's so different with every every situation you play in. It's a, it's really neat. Here's Mark Gelfel from Audacity on varied repetition. When you repeat something, for example, a scale or an etude, you don't want to do it the same every time. If you vary it a little bit, it gives you more resilience in the skill. 
And not only that, it resets this kind of initial learning curve each time you do it very differently so that you can make more gains, get those initial gains of learning faster over and over and over again by repeating your material in different ways. That's what varied repetition is. Fast, slow, um, legato, staccato, angry, joyful. And one way that we allow you to do that in Modacity is by taking notes and you can just make a note that says, play it joyfully, play it angrily, and archive and unarchive and cycle through your favorite variations. I do that a lot with uh, different keys, for example, on licks that I'm learning. You can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash CBC. And thank you, Modacity, for sponsoring the podcast. I am so proud to have my course with Discover Double Bass, Beginner's Classical Bass, out in the world. This was a long time coming, friends. And this course is designed, as the name implies, for beginner bassists who want to learn how to play classical music or for more experienced players who wish to revisit the foundations of technique. The course is comprised of 66 lessons over four hours and covers a wide range of topics on classical bass, which will make a real difference to you playing. It is the perfect course for beginners. I feel weird saying that since it's my course, but I, I definitely believe in it, to build a solid foundation of double bass technique and to help you feel confident playing. Many of the Lessons include transcriptions of the pieces, exercises, and etudes, so you have everything you need to practice at home. I spent hundreds of hours putting this together over the last few years. I'm so glad to see it out in the world. We have a link to it in the show notes, or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. You know, there's a wonderful bassist in, in the contemporary, more experimental music world for bass named Gaylord DeWald. He's up in the Northeast uh, United States, and he recorded an album... Uh, I think ju the year before the pandemic or whatever, it came out during the pandemic where he went out to, I believe it's rural Colorado. There's this really cool old water tank that people in the contemporary music world love. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's like the tank.org. I don't think that's the website, but it's something like that. And, and they, and the acoustics in this thing are ridiculous. Like it's like a 30 second uh, decay time. And so this, this track, it's just wow. him inside this space, which they, had it used to be like just a gorilla space like people would just break in basically and record and then and then maybe 10 15 years ago whatever they actually turned it into a performance space and there are events there but his album is super cool because it starts with him closing the door to the space and so you hear this like boom and it just like goes and then everything he does on the bass sort of like evolves from that and that got me really thinking just about how 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 fascinating the space can be you know uh, so it's not it's obviously your bass and the setup of your bass and whatever and where the ears or the microphones are but then also yeah how the space whether it's that church or the concert hall or gaylord's crazy tank out in colorado um just how much that can affect the sonic experience i mean it you walk into a space and sometimes you just know you, you like you speak and you're like, wow, this is going to be really fun to play in. And I, at least that's my experience. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. yeah, for sure. For sure. When did you get interested in audio engineering? Did you, did you come to college with that in mind or did you come in strictly for bass or how did that work for you? Oh no, actually it's so funny how that turned out because I, I came to college originally as like a music educator and that lasted two weeks and then I switched to performance and I was all about um, orchestral music for two years. And this project kind of evolved out of this SRT minor that I, I started just because I had the free time and I was paying the tuition. I was like, oh, I can record my own bass playing. And that's like a cool thing to do. And that was always like what it was supposed to be is just like, I'll record my playing. And if it's like, I get to have a couple of free audition tapes because I know how to do it myself, that's cool. And it evolved into this crazy passion where now it's half of what I do and I love recording everybody. And it's really funny. I had this conversation, especially when I was trying to decide whether or not I was gonna go to graduate school or if I was gonna not do it. I was on the phone with uh, Lauren Pierce mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, I really just love playing my music and i don't know if like the like the orchestral scene is right for me but i i halfway through this project and i love setting up microphones and i love working with musicians and i love collaborating with composers and she's like go do that <laughs> go do that and i was like okay well all right and <laughs> here we are i mean <laughs> 
Well, it's a, it's a great example of, you know, the more I meet people and learn about what you can do in music, the more I realize that there is to do. And if you find something you're into, just like Lauren said, go do that because you can make it work. I have found, I like, like, and I used to probably not believe that back 20 years ago or whatever when I was, uh, I don't know, let's see, how old am I now? 22 years ago when I was graduating from college um, with my undergrad. But like, I've just seen so many people, like the one of my friends out here in the West, West Ish coast um uh nick villalobos he d and two of his friends decided hey let's just make let we want to play string trio covers and tour the world and that's exactly what they did and have done and you're like no one was looking for cello bass violin like covering stuff and then writing their own original stuff then here they are lewis levitt another friend of mine out in new york city like i want to play string i want to play string quintets not, but not the like three that are commonly played. We want to play stuff that are uh, with my friends from Aspen that are written for us. Guess what? That's what they did. So it's 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 incredible, and especially like taking something like like you're 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 doing that great thing of like taking a few things that you're really good at. Um, uh, it's it you know to get to this is maybe a weird analogy, but I've heard it several times. It's like if you can, the amount of effort it takes to like I'm going to use Chicago analogies, but to get on the Bulls, okay that's a lot of work but to become michael jordan that's like a hundred times that if you can like get to that 90th percentile maybe it's a bad example of the book but but if you can do that in a couple things you have this like killer uh yeah like unstoppable right so like being g good at audio engineering being good at bass founding the, i can't wait to see what you do and in terms of commissions and that sort of thing that's really cool Oh, thank you. I really can't wait to see what I do too. It's a little terrifying right now. Oh yeah. Well, the great <laughs> the great thing is like we're pressing I, on. Yeah, well, I think it's terrifying for everybody, and that's some, another thing I think I've learned over the years is like if you look at somebody who's been do, do yeah, it's true in any career but we can just use music somebody who's been out professional in the world for like 10 15 20 years their their bio or their resume looks neat and tidy they have all these steps but in the moment it's chaos you have no idea what's that there's a pandemic i'm gonna move somewhere i don't know anybody blah, blah, blah. but then you look behind you and you're like oh yeah this led to this led to this led to this but i think that finding something this is i'm stealing this from diana gannett the former university of michigan base professor but she i i oh asked asked her years ago like what advice you give to uh someone going into college and uh, I think that's the age range but she said just find what you're passionate about when you wake up in the morning find what fascinates you and chase that similar to what Lauren said and you'd be amazed what you can do absolutely <laughs> yeah well so audio uh let me just because I have an audio engineer on the line here and I, I never get to talk um so Pro Tools is your is your DAW of choice is that what you uh do most of your work in or have done yes that's correct okay okay give me um what if you had five top five desert island plugins you could only have five you could only have five for the rest of your life uh do five come to mind? You know, actually, everything that I did um, on this album was uh, an I like an isotope, okay. ozone, okay. RX type plugin. I mean, that's okay. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Go, go isotope. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay. And like the stock, even the stock plugins, like the reverb and the EQ are just good. And I think a lot of people can get too bogged down about like plugins and software and um, essentially you should be chasing a sound and the sound should yeah. be already in your head before you're you're fiddling with anything and i think that's the most like in terms of efficient efficiency of workflow but also like you end up getting a product that you're much happier with i mean like cat's cradle could have been a thousand hour project if i wanted to <laughs> just kind of fiddle with settings but i knew exactly um what kind of sound I was going for. And part of that made the recording process a little bit tricky. I mean, I've never acted as both the performer and the engineer on a project. And it's infuriating when you know exactly the sound you want to come out of your instrument and you're not going to leave that room until you get it, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. That's a good 
philosophy, by the way, with the plugins. I have a, I get horrible cases of gear acquisition syndrome or plugin acquisition syndrome. I, I used to teach an electronic music course back uh, 10 years ago at this point now, an Ableton Live course, essentially. That's why I'm so into Ableton. But oh my goodness, I was, I have, I own so <laughs> many stinking plugins. And I started to get back into it a couple of years ago, and I just have not allowed myself to ever buy anything new. And I really try to do almost everything just in Ableton, you know, or maybe I'll break out a couple of native instruments plugins I have, you know, just for fun. But I'm trying to like, it's amazing what you can, you could do so much with the tools you have. You know, I think we're always chasing the bright and shiny new thing. Um, I've got a, so th thinking about being the performer on your project and the, the mixer on your project uh, or the audio engineer on your project, it reminds me of this great book I read by Eric Serafin, who's a hip hop producer, I think, and it's Zen and the Art of Mixing. Um, it's, it was written a while ago. I don't know how well it holds up, uh, but it, but he talked about when he would mix or sit down and work, he had a very specific order that he would do things, and he would his whole thing was to like move quickly. Like if like like you can get, get bogged down in a project, and like you said, have it take like a thousand hours. And his and he, he I don't remember all his steps, but I remember he had these real sort of like it just got some inertia going. Like how how do you have do you have like a sort of set of steps that have evolved for you when you're, um, do you, we call it mixing? Like what would you call that step of the project for you or engineering or what? So just because there was only the, the bass on the soundtrack, there's not a whole lot to mix together. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but there was a whole bunch of editing. No, totally. Okay. I know that, I mean, there's not a track on that album that's over three minutes and I must've had like an hour or two hours of recorded audio for each one. Cause wow. it was just, I, would take a million takes of just like measures until I found exactly what I wanted. And it was cutting that together in a way that sounded really organic. Um, and hopefully <laughs> that came across. It, but... it, it, do, it does come across. So like, how the heck do you organize all that content? Cause I've done a little, like, again, these are like my very amateur pandemic projects. I, I recorded some music that I really wasn't ready to record. So I had to do like, five takes of some things and at this like disaster zone of an Ableton set. And I, I am mean, playing like nothing that complex, but, and I, but I'm not trying to put it out, you know? So like, how do you, how do you organize all that stuff? Do you like go through and, and, uh, uh, bookmark or whatever the phrases in, in pro tools, like, 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 and write notes to yourself or like, how the heck do you organize all that? You hit the nail on the head. The, like the number one thing is you just need to know the music cold. Like, because even if you have this stuff so internalized, I think most of the tracks I was playing from memory by the time we were recording, um, you're still going to do like 20 takes of a section because you're not going to get everything that you want every single time. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I, there was a lot of like paper management. Like I had the scores printed out and I was marking off, okay, these are the sections that I know will cut easily. And I was like, okay, well, I need to get this much. And then within there... Um, just kind of going through my workflow. Granted, it was a little bit more difficult because when I'm working as an engineer, I sit there at my laptop and I just make a note and I write it in. But when you have a base, you have to put it down and run over and make a note and pick it back up, which is <laughs> its own its own struggle. But it's a lot of that. And I mean, like some of my, my notes aren't even coherent to me anymore because it was just like, maybe question mark and then I would run back and I'd record three more takes and it's it's really kind of you, you play it by ear and you try and trust yourself to remember all the things while also giving yourself enough information to remember all the things I think. right <laughs> right for sure uh what I, 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 this has changed for me as I've, as I've gotten older. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's changed. Back when I was taking orchestra auditions and making audition tapes, I, if I did multiple takes, they always got worse. <laughs> um, as as I have started to do a few more recording projects, like for, for various things, I mean, I rarely have to record myself for, I've done a, a couple things though. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think I'm a little more strategic about how I record. Like I know I'm going to have to do things a few times. So oftentimes the take I use is the last take these days. Um, or do you find yourself, were you using, were you like, uh, was that what you were doing? Or are you, do you, uh, I mean, you could graph the quality of my playing back 20 years ago when I was doing recording projects. It was just like a downward line you know i i never use anything after i had done more than a couple runs and i think that's like a very common thing for everyone really you get like three good takes and after that it's like are you even really like thinking about what you're playing i mean 
and I th this isn't mine. Like, there's no way I've coined this, but it's always either the first or the last take. It's never any of the ones in the middle, but it's the first or the last one. And I think a good way to look at it is, I mean, I know I end up I ended up recording like everyone at Bowling Green's like masters and undergraduate audition tapes this year. And there are a lot of situations where people will sit down and they'll be like, let me just run that again. And I'm like, okay, but if you don't have like a certain degree of intentionality of like, okay, why didn't that happen? What am I going to change? What, how am I going to approach this differently? Is it going to get better? You might, you might fluke right through it and it'll sound great. Or we might be here for an hour and we might not <laughs> improve the take at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's sort of the weird human psychology that we all deal with. Um, <laughs> as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at like trying to remember that everything is getting cemented in my brain, whether I want it to or not. So if I'm like, if I start perseverating over some passage, I'm, I'm, I'm just as likely to make it worse if I, if I am not real, like you said, intentional about it. Uh, here, here's a question. Uh, I know this has been true for me, but like, how has um, has audio engineering changed the way you think about playing the bass? I know as I got into audio, I started to de and and as actually as I got into conducting too, there might be some commonalities. I really started to think differently about how I played. Like when you started getting into this and starting the SRT major, do you think it did change the way you think about making sound on your bass or just bass in general? It's funny. I mean. I've had teachers forever, even like just one off. I think I took a lesson with Kevin Brown and he was like, do you have good headphones? Do you have microphones? You just start recording yourself. It'll change your playing. And at that point I hadn't started doing SRT and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get around to that. But it's, it's insane, especially once you're recording on like, I mean, not everyone needs this, but once I was regularly recording on like a thousand dollar microphones and hearing exactly what was happening in my playing, I mean, this project happened, but also like my graduate tapes, I was able to just record myself every single day and listen back in Pro Tools and like isolate sections. And it's, it's gnarly what you can hear in like a space like that with like the sterility of like, this is what you sound like. There's nothing, there's no tricks being played on you by a space or your ears. It's exactly what happened in that room. <laughs> yeah, especially when you get into those high level mics, right? Like that is what you're hearing. I was talking to Susanna Klein, a wonderful violin professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we were talking about just recording in general. And she and I were of the same opinion. It's like, it's better to record yourself often, regardless of what you're recording on. But when you get the chance, every once in a while definitely record yourself on some good mics like i don't know about you me i'll record on my iphone often just because it's there and i and I, there's so much benefit for, okay there's so much benefit for me to just hear myself back but i do i mean you really learn a lot about everything when you get on those great mics and i th talking to people who've won auditions at, when they started to put a mic in the hall and play in the hall and really listen back to that tape as they were preparing i think blake henson if i remember right from the new york phil harmonic he is like so many people obsessed might be the word with recording records himself all absolutely all the time records video uh, with his students on the iPhone and slows it down and plays it back and all that kind of stuff so um, do you record a lot uh, just like in your own bass practice like uh, apart from actually putting together an album is that like a daily part of your practice I do and actually it's funny the moment I I started getting into this. I mounted a, a microphone that I'm speaking to you on right now to my desk. And now it's like, I just play in front of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, why wouldn't I? I mean, I'm going to be practicing here anyway. You might as well get a record and be able to listen back. Cause I mean, it's, it's that intentionality unless you know what's wrong and it's very hard to know what's going wrong in your playing unless you're hearing it. And a lot of times we're just so in the zone of like technique and fingerings and bowings that we don't think, did that sound good? Is that something that I want to play in front of someone else? Um, Absolutely. And the, and the, and if you can get into that, this is one of the greatest things about recording. I, I don't think I realized this until a couple of years ago. Uh, you want to get out of the habit of judging your playing as you're playing, if that makes sense. Like the reason we have stage fright or go uh, spiral down is we're, we're, we're judging. Oh no, that wasn't great. You know, uh, you need to think about that. But if you can get, if you can develop a separation between like the performance of the music and the analysis of the music and analyzing, if that makes sense, you know, I think, I think that's one of the greatest things about aside from just like learning how you really sound and getting that objective perspective just trying to have that separation i think is huge and, and i think also in terms of like stage fright people get really scared 
in recording sessions mm -hmm. and i think like we do all this work to prepare for auditions mm -hmm. and there's like a neglecting of the reality that you're gonna have to play for a microphone eventually and you're gonna mm -hmm. have to play for a microphone a lot mm -hmm. and you have the power to do that as much as you care to do that and it's it's totally just like a the same you practice it until it doesn't feel like it's a, a thing to be in front of a microphone and a camera this will come out after the album comes out, but just at, like, how are you releasing this? Are you putting this out on, uh, what platform are you putting this out on? This is going to be on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. It's going to be up on SoundCloud, um, high resolution downloads will be available on Bandcamp. Uh, anywhere that you listen to music, it'll be there. And that's happening May 23rd. Beautiful. I think I've got stuff posted through May 20th. So this will be not too long after that. We'll get this. <laughs> totally. We'll get this out there. Um, this is great. A anything else? You, where, where do you want me to be? I guess that's the place to send people anywhere else you want me people, people to check you out or if they want to hire you for a recording project or anything like that. I don't know if you have anything set up yet. Uh, ha I'm happy to direct people anywhere. My website is just Christopher Jeffer. Um, reach out i'm really i'm looking to do projects with anyone and i love i love working with people who have like the, a vision and just want to like make that happen and i'm willing to go in all sorts of directions with you with you you know <laughs> whatever play bass or record stuff i'm into it <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome. i'll send people there i'll send people to the album uh anything else you want to get out there for folks yeah i mean just like Big thanks to Mike Lorello, mastering engineer, the three composers of uh, Leah Tracy, Stephen Naylor, Delaney Molnar. Like, thank you so much. And MK Rapplinger, who did the artwork, which is just so cool. And I'm so excited for everyone to see it. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check him out online at ChristopherJeffer.com. And again, links to Cat's Cradle are in the show notes. And yeah, very cool. Can't wait to see what you do. After this, Chris, and to be able to do this during a pandemic, bravo. <laughs> I hope that the pandemic has been easing up for you. It certainly has for us here in California, which is great. I don't know exactly when this is going to be released, but uh, this episode is going to be released sometime in mid-June. June 15th is supposed to be when California is, quote-unquote, officially open. So we'll see exactly what that means. But what it's meant so far, I'm recording this uh, June 2nd. Is that what today is, I think? the, the This outro for this episode. Episode. Uh, things are get the restaurants are full of people. There's live music back much more. I have yet to see a large ensemble concert, but I know that those are coming too. So things are all moving in a positive direction. I'm finally traveling again, which has been great. And I've got a trip to Los Angeles coming up here in a couple of weeks to be a teacher for Celito de Jesus's wonderful Raboth Institute, Los Angeles. I did that in 2019, and I just think the world of her and what she does, and it's very cool. So I'm excited, looking forward to getting out of the house a little bit more, and looking forward to doing some of these podcasts in person again. That will be a welcome change after... Uh, 14, 15 months, whatever it is of, of not doing that. And looking forward to doing many of them here in San Francisco as folks pass through town. A uh, surprising amount of people, maybe not surprising, but a good number of people come through this city for work or for travel or such. And so it's been a lot of fun to have actually quite a few guests on the podcast these past few years, meet up with them here in the city. I live in North Beach. It's a really fun area of town. And yeah, I've got, I bought a couple of mics to to try to do a little podcast studio thing here at the place when people are in town. But I'm also looking forward to getting on the road and taking in some places and hopefully more places will continue to open up. I know that things are not even around the world and lots of struggles in various parts of Europe and Australia. As I'm recording this, Melbourne's in another lockdown of indefinite length. So it's tricky, but uh, I hope to see you again, whether it's online at the International Society of Bases Convention, which will have already happened by the time this comes out, or at one of these base events or somewhere else. I was doing a little bit of work and research on base events. Actually, I've been doing this for the last four years, five years, or something like that. We've had a list of base camps that we've maintained on the blog that hasn't been maintained uh, the past year because there were no base camps, really. But 
it, that that uh, list is almost up to 52 at this point. So that means one week, every every week, there is some sort of base camp or festival going on somewhere in the world. And that is just incredible. That number has only been increasing. So it'll be fun to get out and be a part of more of those events. And I hope to see you at some of them. If you want to reach out and say hi, feedback at Contrabass Conversations is where you can do it. And I respond to every message. Love hearing from folks. If you are looking for a good way to download and save some of these podcasts and get a few extra features to boot, boot, okay, Jason, uh, uh, contrabassconversations.com slash app. We have a free app, iOS, Android, a Kindle app even. I believe it's on Kindle. And, and that's a convenient way, especially if you're looking for topics. That's a really good way to dig into the podcast. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Henshee, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. The theme music is by Eric Hochberg, a jam that Eric Hochberg and I am doing the Arco bass that we did back in 2007. Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area just east in Kilgore, Texas. Learn more about his excellent work at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Ethan. We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh-huh.